Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Beyond the Track. This is episode number 28. Lorenzo Camparisi is with me, and I'm excited to learn more about this rider. Uh, for everyone tuning in, we're going we're gonna to dive into some things. And Lorenzo, I first want to welcome you to the show. Thanks for coming on. Hello. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. So, Lorenzo, you've been here racing now for a while. Everybody's kind of learning who you are in the moment, but there's a lot about your background that we don't know, and I'd like to explore that. Uh, early in this episode. Let's just go back to the very beginning. Uh, where are you from and where did your racing career start? Um, I am from Italy, so I live in a small town uh, like 30 minutes away from, uh, you know, the famous Venice. Um, I started when I was seven years old uh, and uh, 50, you know, the 50 CC. Uh, my family is not really into dirt bikes. Uh, my dad just love, you know, uh, engines in general. Uh, he like, uh, like uh, rally cars. He, he does some races on the four wheels. Um, and one day we went to a small, uh, you know, like the race that you have in the small towns. And they were, there were like those small peewee, but like the China version of the peewee uh, for sale, like the super cheap one. And, uh, you know, was, uh, I, I felt in love with it. And I asked uh, my dad if he could buy me one. And uh, he didn't want to. So like for one year straight after that, uh, I was keep forcing him, you know, like I want it, I want it, I want it. Uh, and after uh, one, almost one year, so when I was seven, uh, he bought me the first little door bikes, and from there we started. But it was everything new for both because uh, he didn't have any, you know, uh, background on any dirt bikes or any bikes in general. So it was kind of uh, learning the the procedure, you know, uh, together. So it's just crazy. In the early years, I, I mean, what was the reason why they weren't really? getting into it i mean you obviously wanted to but did, is it because they didn't really know enough uh, was it a fear of injury thing like you know every parent has their reason why maybe they hold back in the beginning what what was it for you guys uh well my family has never been you know into dirt bikes so they, they didn't really know how it was uh and of course when you don't know you don't really know how dangerous it is and you don't actually uh know how to do it so it's just a new job you know you get uh you get to know it and you need, you know you need to get used to it so uh we started just me and my dad uh like my mom and my my sister they they never get into it uh and then um in italy it's not very popular you know in us uh everybody has like almost a dirt bike uh, uh, in space uh, uh, like in california uh, a lot of guys has dirt bikes there are a lot of trucks in italy where i live it's even hard to find like a dirt bike trucks, you know? So that's pretty much why. So, okay. So when the riding and racing start happening, then obviously you're, you're trying to figure out where this stuff goes on. Um, where was it going on? I mean, how, how far did you have to travel to get like racing going? And as you moved up through the 50s, 60s, what, where well, all the racing? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot of different, you know, in, uh, in Europe, also in Italy. Uh, we don't have like those Loretta Lens uh, races where like all, uh, the country move in these races. We have those like uh, um, town or how do you say area uh, races where you start on. Um, and pretty much we started doing this as a joke, you know, just uh, father and son time. And after that, I keep like going faster and faster, but without any um, anyone telling me how to do it, you know, it was just out of myself and just out of my dad telling me, hey, maybe you need to break here and maybe you need to give a little bit of gas there, you know, just, uh, just as a joke, just a uh, as you buy a kid, maybe a, a football ball and you play with your dad, you know? So after that, we just keep moving and moving. And then we start with just the national championship, the Italian, with the small 65. And that was, was so hard for me. I was like 10 years old and I, my best result was around like 15 position because I really didn't know how to even ride, you know, a dirt bike. So, um, after that, uh, my dad uh, uh, put me in a, like a class. There was a, a guy called Christian. He's a, he's a racer. He was racing the World Championship back in the days. And he started to teach me a little bit. And from there, he, he helped us, you know, to find out like the European Championship, how it's supposed to be, suspensions, wheels, dirt bike, 85, 65. Um, and into that has been always, you know, a chase for a better race or a better result, but uh, without any... Um, advice from like, you know a family that has been or like a old champion that already know what to eat or what to ride or even how you know to fix a bike my first race is i lost them you know because my chain was keep falling off and we didn't know why so that's so like uh kind of dumb that, I mean, that's tough in the beginning because obviously yeah. you're motivated you're trying to do well but you guys don't know anything i mean that that's a big challenge but i guess as it's getting better and you start getting faster 
um, obviously things come around. But my yes. question, I guess, would be, what about Antonio Caroli or Supercross? Like, when did those become aware for you? Like, when did you know who Antonio was and his background? And then when did you know what Supercross was and maybe start getting the interest when I get older, I'd love to be there. Like, take me through that chapter when that happened. Well, uh, when I moved to 85 class, you know, I started to race the European Championship. So, of course, you start to see uh, the World Championship and you understand who Antonio Caroli is. You know, it's, a, it's such a star for me. It's a nine-time World Championship and he's from Italy. So, that's just crazy. Um, and I started to race the European Championship with, like, my best career result when I was, uh, like, with the Super Mini. I finished fourth in the European Championship. Uh, and then since there, you know, I met all the big boys on the, on the 450 and 250 class and I said, you know, that's, that's what I love to do. And that's what I would love, you know, to keep going on. Uh, and when I moved on the 125 class, uh, so it's, you, you pass from like the smallest bike to a bigger bike. And that's like kind of a hard uh, switch when you're a kid. Uh, and then I got a big injury. I broke my, my arm pretty bad. I had like three surgery. Uh, and as a present, because I couldn't ride for almost a year, my dad took me to, uh, you know, motocross vacation in California for just, you know, have fun and, you know, uh, start to ride the bike again as a present. And we come in Anaheim one and we watch the Supercross and that was just insane, you know, what just everything out of the world. And, you know, that uh, was my dream, you know, to come here in the US and maybe one day be able to race the, the 250 class or 450, you know, just to be able even to watch again the races was just a dream. So that's how I start to dream and, uh, about Supercross. You know, when you look at different European riders in the past, you'll see a Marvin Muscan or a Ken Roxon. They, they come here, they want to race here. Um, and then you see riders like uh, Cairoli or Hurlings who really love that series and stay there. Did you have any feelings at that time of maybe I should stay uh, doing MXGP um, or should I come to America? Was there kind of a, a, a turning point where you had to make a decision on where you wanted to go? Because you're right at the age where you could go either way. But yeah. you're here now. So how did you make that decision? Well, you know, as, uh, as I told you before, my dad didn't really know how to do it. And uh, it's just out of me. I said, I'd rather do, you know, be in the U.S. Also because you learn a new, a new uh, language like English. So even maybe if it's not your future, you experience a new languages, a new lifestyle, new everything. And in Europe, it's such as, you know, hard to get into the training. You need to train in the sand. You have to be uh, out of the house for a long time and be, uh, you know, super into it super because it's a little bit you know uh easier to train and ride and you know you're in the same place for training uh and the series is more uh not easy to race but you know easy to organize you know because 250 is just one coast so i feel like it was just a little bit easier for me and both sides you learn more you know because you can learn english and you can be uh in california that's a dream place to be you know that's that's pretty much why in the USA, it's a big country as far as the size goes. So there is a lot of travel. Yes. But is it easier because you're in the same country so things are familiar where if you're doing the GPs, I yeah. mean, you're in Asia, you're in South America, you're in Europe and all these different countries where you have customs and all that. So again, is, is, it, is that why it's a little bit easier here? Because at least it's all the same. Even if you're traveling to Houston or Indianapolis, it is yes. somewhat close to the same. Yes, that's pretty much why. And also because... I love Supercross much more than outdoors. So that's like 80% uh, of the choice just because, you know, I come here to watch and I fell in love with it. So my heart was, you know, pushing for Supercross. That's pretty much why. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just a dream. Now, and Supercross obviously is a different discipline. It's a different yeah. style of riding for you. When did that turn uh, like the page for you where you began to really like Supercross? Because again, to watch it at Anaheim is one thing. But then you yeah. had to get on it and start riding it. Um, was that an easy transition at first? Did you get right on the track and fine, or did did you have a you know, a little bit of a tough transition? Well, it 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 was it was tough, and it's still tough right now because, as I told you before, uh, in Europe it's kind of hard to have you know supercross trucks like in the U.S. Especially in Italy, we just have two trucks in all the country, and the country is pretty much as big as California. Uh, and luckily, I have one that is like two hours from where I live. So I start training there a little bit, and then we have a small series in Italy. It's the National Supercross Championship, but it's like even easier uh, of the future. So once you start on there, you're like, you know, I'm kind of good on this, but once you move out of Italy and you start to race in France and Germany, things get harder. So you keep uh, improving your, your style, your, your technique and everything. 
but once you come in the US, it's just another another sport. It's just crazy. Even like today, like this year, uh, when I go home for like four, five, six months, and then I come back in the States, it's just so hard to get used to the rhythm, to the moves, because everything is so fast and big, and people don't realize through the, through the TV, but it's just really technique. So I'll tell you a little story. I raced uh, in Germany different times of my career. They have the German Supercross Series. Yep. And I remember being there one year riding for a Suzuki team, and I was teammates with Ken Roxon, and he was on an 85. And they were talking about how this there's this kid coming up, this German kid. Oh, he's just, he's got it. He's got it. And he was my teammate uh, that weekend. I watched him ride. And I was like, man, that he has a lot of talent. He has a lot of super cross yeah. understanding for a little kid. Obviously, he's the points leader now. So I think it's, <laughs> he's Ken Roxon. But did you get a chance to ever go to Germany or Bercy or Barcelona that they have these big races? Did you yeah. ever get a chance to do that? Yes, uh, it's uh, it's been uh three years that I'm racing in Europe. So I've been like racing Paris Supercross, Geneva Supercross. I raced two years on the 250 uh, in Germany because uh, you have, uh, um, you can uh, race the 250 only when you're 21 or lower age. So I raced two times for Kawasaki. Fail is like the bigger team of uh, Germany for Kawasaki uh, with some good results, you know, but uh, it was fun and kind of, you know, different. But once you come in the US, uh, it's just, crazy different so it's it cool it, it is even their series again those tracks are yeah. more comparable to our arena cross tracks in size yes. um you know at least the german supercross ones are they're real sticky ruddy so it is a different vibe it kind of feels sort of the same but i know when you get on an american supercross track it's opened up the obstacles are different so yeah it's not fully comparable it, again it, it feels the same a little but it's not um, now let's talk about when you started riding Supercross here. Again, you said the transition is still hard, but it was in the beginning. What, what was the hardest thing? Was it the whoops? Was it the rhythm sections? I mean, what, what at the beginning was like, man, this is going to be hard to figure out. Like for me, the biggest things was the, you know, the triples, like the main, like the biggest triples. I was just so scared to hit them because you have the first time with the 250, you have to pin it. So you're like, that's insane like that's a big jump with no mistake and if you case it or even you uh you jump it too far you're getting hurt so that uh, was a big step for me these days you see kids like you you see 85 kids super mini kids they jump huge jumps but me coming from a family that they never take me even to a, like a small supercross track i didn't even have this feeling with doubles or with empty jumps you know so it was hard transition and then once you get uh, into uh, the triples and everything. Now the main the main difficulty for me is to get the rhythms done quick, you know, because whoops are pretty much always the same finish line triples. With 250, it's hard, you know, to over jump, but rhythms you need to be precise. That's my main, you know, hard things to to be quick at. Yeah, and all the tracks now have multiple yeah. rhythm sections. Yes. Um, and then there might be like a triple triple in the middle. So for you, that's still a little bit of a challenge. And obviously, by the end of qualifying, you got it. You're ready to go racing. Yep. But does that still, throughout the morning qualifying, take the longest to get figured out for you? Yeah, that's, that's my main problem. That's what I'm trying to work on. But for me, it's so hard because every time that series finish, I have to fly back home. Uh, and then I don't really have the time and the, the trucks to train my skills on. So, yeah, that's my main problem. Uh, as you see, I'm not super good in the qualification, in, like in lap times, because it takes me so long to get comfy to the track. Uh, and then as long as I keep racing and riding, I get better at it. But uh, yes, uh, it's the same feeling, you know, when you maybe go skydiving that you are in the plane and you're like, oh, you know, that fear that you have to jump off of the plane. Um, that's, that's for me, it's very hard, you know, to, to just get used to it and just jump because I feel I have the technique. I have, you know, the right things to be able to do it. But just my mind is a little bit uh, uh, in panic. I don't know if it makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. Where, uh, where are you staying right now? Where, where are you living while you're here? Uh, well, when I come in the U.S., normally I stay in California because it's easier for me uh, to train in those like public track where you can train and ride. Uh, and then for this year where uh, I race East Coast, we book, uh, it's me and another French guys. Uh, we split the cost and we uh, race by race. We rent an uh, Airbnb and we drove here with a pickup truck and a big uh, trailer so we could fit everything inside. Uh, so that's, that's a big journey, you know, big adventure. That is tough, but is that kind of cool too in a sense? Yes. I mean, I, I'm, I'm 38 years old now, but in my life, I've driven across this country. I can't even count how many times as a kid and as an adult. So for me, I don't really see these things and go, oh, wow, wow. I've been to all these places. But for you, 
when you're driving across the country, you're like, wow, this is Texas or Colorado or wherever yeah. you're going through. We, it's, it's we stop to every single, uh, like when you cross the, the state, that you, there is a new state, we, we stop each, uh, each time to take picture on the, on the name of the, of the state and everything. So, because for us, it's, everything is, you know, new and cool because uh, I'm not even from US. So just to be like traveling for me, it's, it's, it's insane. What's, uh, what's California like for you? I mean, based on your upbringing and your life and the traveling you've done, you get to Southern California and it's its, its own place, no question. Uh, how's it been for you so far? Oh, I, I mean, it, it's cool. I love it. You know, uh, the weather is fantastic. Uh, everything turn around dirt bikes. Everybody has a dirt bike. You Even when you're in the freeway, you see guys with pickup truck and dirt bikes. Uh, and that's, you know, for my kind of lifestyles, it's what I love. And so that will be my dream place to be. But at the, at the same time, it's very, very expensive to live on. So uh, it, it's cool. That's my dream place to be. But, you know, you, you need to be able to, to live good. For sure. Where uh where do you where do you eat mostly when you're in Southern California? I gotta I gotta know where, what's your uh, what's your favorite spots? Oh, normally I eat at home because uh, I'd rather you know eat at home and cook my own meal. But uh, I really love steakhouse. That's my best place to go. Okay, so that's when you get out. That's where you go. Yeah. I was wondering because you hear people from outside of California and they want In and Out Burger, or you go down to uh, oh. Whataburger in Texas. So that everywhere's got their own little spots and. Um, you know, the, I really, I really like meat. So, like in California, my favorite place is Texas Roadhouse. Yeah, uh, that's where I go most. But uh, uh, even In and Out for me is a good fast food. But you know, you you should you should you should not tell that you go fast food when you're trying to race. So, uh, I try to don't go there as much. Sneak it in when you have to, maybe once or twice. Uh, and then exactly. Texas Roadhouse, do you get the uh, do you like the bread when it comes out? The the buttered bread. It's good. Butter bread is good, but it's good. Not good for you either, but no. <laughs> you gotta get a couple of them. But um, how how did the off season go for you coming in? I mean, did you did you get the prep? I know you're if you're riding in SoCal, you're at uh, probably Hammett and State Fair. There's a lot of riders there. You get to ride with Christian Craig when he's there. Um, how was your off season coming in? Well, for me, the off season was was super short and crazy. You know, because COVID didn't help at all. Um, maybe uh, some guys don't know, but when you're not from US, you need a spur, uh, certain type of visa. Uh, to get in the USA and with this COVID, uh, any European guy were, weren't allowed to come in the US. So uh, I come so late because I had to get all the proper uh, papers to get in the US even with COVID. So I just rode around like even less than a month in the Supergas trucks. Um, and then I had some bike problem because uh, Kawasaki just released a brand new bike. And then uh, we had some problems because we didn't know what was going to break, uh, even with stock bike. So I pretty much rode like three full weeks on Supercross, uh, Hammett, uh, State Fair, and then there is a private truck uh, where I can ride. Uh, it's from Whiny, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, and then when you see those factory riders, you know, they have factory bike, uh, so much technique, so many hours on the bike, you're like, damn, I have to race with those guys and I <laughs> like training in like, three weeks and then I'm gonna go racing it just you feel like it's a joke but you know we're trying to, to race and we're here so I'm happy I'm being able to have a good result even if I had a, a big crash in Houston too but um, I feel like if I can have the proper training before uh, and proper seat time on the bike I can be much better but could be worse. For sure I, and now that we've gotten into this series a little bit I mean what's been some of the highlights for you when you look at your season so far a race where you can go, yeah, that's that's me. That's the real me. I want to be like that more. Have yeah. you had a race like that yet this year that stands out? Yes, the first race, like the really first race, I had my best hit race result. I finished seventh. I was sixth until like pretty much a lap to go. Um, and I'd rather finish seventh because, you know, I was like, maybe the guy behind me is going to T-ball me. So I just let him go because for me, the main goal was to get in the main event. Uh, I had a seven. Seventh place, that was me. Uh, even if in the main event, I didn't have a good result. Um, and I, it was, for me, it was okay, you know, because first main event of the year, you don't want to crash. You don't want to have, you know, I'm not chasing a championship like other guys that have to be always, you know, uh, perfect and maybe in the box. So for me, it was a good start, you know, good hit race. And I was really focused and I was like, yes, I can do this. You know, I can be in top 15, top 10. Um, so as we moved on the second race, I was in the A class. That's a new new stuff for me, you know, because I've never been in the A class in qualification, uh, and that's make me a little bit nervous, you know, because you have so many fast guys. They they 
uh, they jump the rhythm so quick, they're so fast, and you know, I had good lap time, but I second or third lap of the last qualification, I had made a big mistake. I cross uh the quad where you were going uh, tabletop plus two, and I land on those tough locks. They're so heavy, and then I, I don't really remember how it crashed. Uh, I had a big concussion, uh, and I uh, injured my shoulder. I'm having so, so, some problem on my rotator cuff. Uh, so from there, i not 100% yet, but um, I'm still riding good. Uh, I don't really know what my 100% will be in the track, but I feel like I can improve uh, race by race. Uh, and for sure, I think in this East Coast series, my best result could be in a top 10 spot. Yeah, that'd be good. I mean, that's a, that's a sweet yeah. spot to be in if you get in the top yes. 10. Obviously good for you and for your sponsors. It's got to be a little bit of a bummer, though, having to deal with some yeah. nagging injuries that are holding you back because if you know your potential can get you there, yeah. you just got to get that body back, right? So that yeah. you can get yeah. that time. And then obviously it makes it hard, too, when you're here you know, in Indianapolis and you can't ride during the week, so you, you can't really improve much. Um, once we leave Indianapolis, we're going to move into the Orlando, go to Florida. Will you have a chance to get more riding in and, and try to build off maybe a preseason that you didn't get all that time? Well, I, I'm not sure because, you know, uh, it's everything is new for me, even just to move uh, place by place. So I don't really know if where even to ride in Orlando and if I will be able to, to practice before the races. For sure, after the finish of the first, you know, uh, seven race of East Coast, I will have the time to regroup my body. Uh, even if now I'm going to the physiotherapist every, almost every day to get, uh, you know, the power and the strength back on my shoulder. Um, I feel like I'm... I can I can build uh, on top of my fitness more you know speed uh, and be ready for last round and maybe hopefully to be in the top twenty for the shootout. Is it hard when you're in California riding on mostly hard packed tracks? I know Hemet can get pretty soft and ruddy, but then you come to Houston and Indianapolis, these softer tracks that break down. Um, is that a pretty big challenge? Seeing as though most of your riding time has been on hard packed soil. Yes, it's it's very challenging for me. Um, not so much because in Europe we have really soft tracks, so I'm kind of used to the ruts, but I'm for sure I'm not used to hit triples or hoops with big ruts, so that's very challenging for me. You said the 250 class is tough, Christian, Craig, Colton Nichols, these guys, you've seen them in California, now you see them here. Do you, on race day or even during the week, are you so focused on yourself that you don't get a chance to watch 450s, or do you watch that 450 class too and try to see if you can learn something that they're doing even though you're not at that stage yet just for the future i do i do watch 450s as soon as i finish my main event i run into the into the seats and i watch those guys because you know even to watch them you can learn so much uh because i'm racing in the same in the same track so i can see where they're going how they're approaching the track the feet the, the movement on the body so for me it's just learning every day even, even if I have the opportunity to watch them in the pits, how they do, how they move, how they just have, you know, the, the little scooter to come the, at the inside the stadium, that's, that's everything you try to learn out of those guys because they, they're the best and the fastest in the world. So everything I see from them, I try to, you know, steal and take it for my advantage. Uh, what 450 rider stands out to you as someone that you really like to watch? Uh, I know for me at different times in my career, I liked different riders and I would try to emulate their style or I would see, I mean, for me, even though he was younger than me, Josh Grant was someone that I would watch the way he rode and I would try to do things like that because I felt like I had a close style to him. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody in the 450 class that you see kind of resembling the way you ride and you go, if I could just figure out how he does that and, you know, and then I can do that. Is there anyone like that for you? Yeah, I, I like uh, the style of Zach Osborne, you know, you know because I'm really – short on the bike and he's kind of short like me so i feel like my my uh, ride style is more close to him because if you watch like uh uh one guy like Ch uh, chancerula like adam is very tall so the movements of the legs are way different than mine's so i like to, to watch uh zach osborne because he's pretty much my same uh, you know height uh that's cool and then when you watch a guy like that who you're obviously you see some comparisons you, you you're hoping that he does well too because you're studying him does it get hard sometimes when you watch how fast he's going and then he's yeah. just having these little problems? Some are his fault, but some aren't. And you're yes. like, man, like my guy, Zach, like he just hasn't had a clean shot at it yet. Is that, does that bum me out sometimes? Yes, it bums me out so much because I feel like, you know, at the, at the start of the season, uh, from where he left last season, I was, I was saying on my mind, I think he's going to be so good, you know. And when I see him racing, you see the result and you're like, ah, oh, you know, he's not 
that good, but then when you see him riding, you see him charging so much, but he has yeah, he is having so many problems like Houston two or Houston three. I don't remember. He crashed like one or two laps to go when he was second, and then he's over jumping. He's having small injury, so I feel like he's not having a good shot for what he can do. That's hard sometimes, right? But that, I mean, that's that's you too. You're in the same situation yeah. right now. You're trying your hardest, but you've got. Yeah. Not minimal time, a little bit of an injury going on. So it's yep. the same thing. The results might not match the way you're riding or at least where you think your potential is. Exactly. That's it's tough, though. That's, I mean, but that, tough. That, you've learned that now probably in Supercross. That's, that's part of Supercross is you get different things thrown at you that you got to deal with. Um, how do you deal with those types of challenges? Do you just, just stay positive and motivated? Or, is it, or do you just perform based on how, how good you feel at that moment? Like how, do you, how do you manage those challenges? Oh, I'm not sure how do I manage them because sometimes, you know, you need to be very strong in your mind. Uh, so sometimes I kind of have, you know, down moment where you're like, oh, I cannot do this. Uh, but at a certain point, you're like, hey, I'm here, you know, so I just need to give my best and see what's going on. So at first I was kind of nervous every time I get in the gate. I was super nervous, you know, because of the result. And now I don't feel the nervous on my side because I feel like that's where I want to be and that's. That's my dream coming true, so I just enjoy it, you know? Uh, just good vibes, you know? Just try to focus on what you can do. Just feel your body. If your body is strong, just push. If you're weak, then just try to regroup and don't, you know, injure yourself and just keep pushing and you will get there. That's what I think most of the time. Um, I see you ride for Kawasaki. That's what you've been on since I've seen you here. Yeah. Uh, is there a specific reason? Do you have a relationship? relationship with those guys very well is it a bike that you like I mean there's options out there but you you seem to locked in on that Kawasaki well at first I love Kawasaki I feel like it's matching kind of my life like uh, riding style because I'm kind of short so it's a good uh, mix for uh, frame and engine uh, since I'm a privateer I don't really have those like big engines big support from uh, 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 big teams where you can have like super fast engines so it's a big mix between good bike and fast engine. Uh, and then, you know, I have a, a good relationship with Bud Racing. Uh, it's a team from France that they are, they are helping me out. Even if those years they don't have a full team right here, they send me some parts, they send me suspensions. Uh, so they're helping me a lot. And that's, uh, that's good for me because uh, it's, it's hard, you know, to have support from other brands and everything. So it, it's good for me, Kawasaki, it's a good deal between everything. Um, after last season, did, did you go straight? Did you do any of the motocross or did you go straight home after yeah. last season? Oh, my, my visa was expired, so I had to fly back home so quick. And uh, I did some races of outdoor in Italy with, uh, with the Italian championship. Um, actually, with a 125, you know, I, uh, I have one, one, 125 Kawasaki uh, because I didn't have a bike in Europe, a 250, because uh, as a privateer, I'm supposed to buy my own bike. Uh, and at that moment, I didn't have enough money to buy another 250. So I just borrow a 125 from a friend of mine. And uh, I actually won the 125 class. You know, the, it's a two-stroke class. Uh, it was fun. So after a while, you know, I got back in the Bud Racing Kawasaki in, in Europe. We have a deal where he sent me some bikes. Um, and then at last minute, I decided to come back in USA and, uh, and race. So I get the proper documents. Now I have a five-year visa so I can stay longer in the U.S., but that doesn't mean I will because, you know, I need money to, to stay, of course. Uh, and for sure, I have to go back at home and work because in Italy, uh, I work. Uh, I'm a normal guy. I work every day and then I train once a week and then I train the weekend. So normally my schedule is to work four or five months in uh, summertime. And then when I have enough money uh, between my family and me, I come in the U.S. and race. That's awesome. What, what do you do at home for work? Um, my, fam my family has a company where we sell water heater uh, and we maintain them. So I just put, you know, like not Kawasaki brand, but the brand of the water heater and I go house by house and where the guys have problems and I fix them. Wow. Okay. And then you said you get to ride maybe one day during the week and train. Yep. And then the weekend you get to go. Now, based on where you're living at home now, it, it, what's, how close is the track? Is it still a long trip to get to some tracks or you got, did you find anything closer? Roughly to get a good track for outdoor, I have like one hour, one hour, 30 minutes. Uh, I have like uh, Arco, it's uh, the, the GP track where you can train during the week or in the weekend. And then I have Mantova, it's another GP track. Um, when there are not the races, those are not so like 
good for training, but they are rough. So for me, it's you know just good to train and have uh, hours on the bike. Uh, but pretty much that's it. So normally I ride uh, in these two those two tracks, and uh, um, I go in the gym every morning between six and eight a.m. before going to work. Uh, and just I'm just focusing all my life through dirt bikes, and you know, beside having enough money to race. Uh, I sacrifice everything, even like social life, everything, because for sure, if you have a dream, uh, even if I would never maybe be a factory rider or maybe in the top five for me just to be here, uh, I'd rather be here and spend all my money on dirt bikes than, you know, be at home and just go out with friends. Right. No, that, and you have plenty of time for that, right? When you get yeah, older exactly. and, and right now you have an opportunity to come and yeah. race. Um, I have to imagine that moving into the future, definitely go home, make some money, but get back here sooner so you can get that prep in before the season. Um, I know it's hard to look that far ahead, but is that the plan this year? Get done with the season, go home, stack up some money again, but then get here quicker so we can yeah. get a little bit more prep? Yes, for sure. I mean, depends everything how uh, the season's going to end because if I would get like such a good result like I'm having right now, like the last races, I'm going to stay and race and train and race last, uh, last race and then the shootout. If I'm not going to be in the top 20, I'm just going to go home sooner uh, and just keep working before. So maybe I will save those two, three months uh, to be able to come before for next year. That's a good plan. What are your, yeah, what are your goals? You said maybe factory rider top five. That's the dream. But do, do, yeah. you, do you have like a big goal that you're trying to chase? Or do you go maybe year by year and go, okay, here's where I am now. Here's where I want to be in a year. Of course, I want to be closer to that. But do you think that far ahead? Or is it a little bit more like what's coming up on the calendar? Well, uh, it's kind of interesting because last year my main goal was getting the main and I, I earned five main out of eight races. So for me, it was just such a new, you know, once you get the goal, you're like, okay, now what's next? You know, you just keep going and see where you are. Uh, so this year I, I come with my, like the goal was having all main events and maybe a, a one race in top 15. Uh, but then I had a small injury, so I didn't really race. I mean, I raced two rounds but I just roll around because I was too much in pain. And then last races in the two, I got 14. So I'm like, okay, I, I earned my, my goal. So now I'm just going, you know, uh, farther uh, races by race and see, just pushing as hard as I can and see where it's going to be, where I'm going to so just beat your record. Like if yeah, we come exactly. on the next one, you get 13th, sweet, better. Yes, and exactly. we go for a 12 or a 10 and then you never know where it ends up. So exactly. I like that. You know, sometimes people have too big of goals or, or maybe it's not too big of a goal for a five-year plan, but they maybe like go, all right, I made a main event and now I want a top 10. So I like that you said, all right, let's go 15. Yeah. And then let's beat that. And I, it's, it's got to feel good when you get it, right? Because you accomplished yes. the goal, but now you got to reset. You got to move the yeah. goalpost a little bit. And what do you think yeah. for you that that next step is? I, I would say we were going to go from 14 to 10 because you see some riders right now who are getting in the top 10 that are around your speed. So you know it's doable. What do you think you need to improve on other than just your fitness and your body and all that time? Where on the track, when the gate goes down, do you feel like you're missing a little bit? Well, for sure, uh, it's, it's pretty much everywhere, you know, like corner speed, uh, staying low in the jumps, boop speed, it's pretty much everything. It's not a single spot where I'm so much lower. Comparated for the, on the top guys, for sure, I'm slower everywhere so much, so much. But compared to maybe the top 10 guy, uh, I feel like it just, just a small mistakes everywhere maybe one dance in the corner two dance in the boobs maybe staying a little bit lower uh but i think those will come with fitness and with uh seat time because like now i'm a little bit you know stiff on the bike because i'm not very comfy with some rhythms with some uh rods and then i get tired leaving in the main event even if i get 14 i was you know having so many uh trouble you know to get stay focused because i was i think i was 11 or 10th, uh, third point of the, of, the, of the race. And then I, I had a small crash. And the small crash I had it is because I was, you know, already so tired uh, that your mind is not really focused into it. So I feel like if I can have more uh, strength on my body and more seat time, it's going to be easier even to go faster. Lorenzo, I got one more question for yep. you. Um, you're here. You're obviously having a good time. You're Texas Roadhouse. You're racing Supercross, <laughs> all these things. Is it hard sometimes though, just with the family and the friends at home and being here for a long period of time where you don't really get to know what everyone's doing? And then, you know, I mean, there's FaceTime and email, there's all the different things you can do, but does it still get kind of hard sometimes just being that detached from everybody at home? Yes, it's hard, you know, because 
even when you get a good result, uh, your, your close friends or your family, they are not right here with you seeing what's going on. So as you know, when you don't uh, live one thing, you don't really, uh, because we live by emotions, you know, if you don't feel the emotion of being here and, and reach the goal and be the top 14, you don't really get what the patient is. So even with my family, sometimes I have, uh, I have a hard you know, time because they're like a little bit old style. They want me to just stay home and work and build my future. But, you know, you have time for this. I'm just, you know, 22 years old and I want to chase my dream. Uh, so sometimes, you know, it's hard and they're far away. So, yeah, it's hard, but my mind is very focused and I know where, uh, where I want to be and for sure I'm going to chase my dream. That's awesome to hear, man. Well, congratulations you. on everything you've done so far. Thank you. I look forward to watching your journey and chasing down those goals. And uh, thank you for coming on Beyond the Track. I Man, this is awesome. Give everybody an opportunity to know you a little bit better and, and uh, know your background and know what you're going through and the challenges that you face to be here. And I, I'm inspired. So uh, congratulations. I look forward to seeing how you do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate, it. I appreciate it, you guys for having me here. You know, uh, as I say, 100 times for me is a dream just to be watching those races and be able to race and be in the main event, be in the top 15 and just be able, you know, talk with you because I love to see your, your videos, your interview, everything uh, on TV and be able just to be here and talk with you for me, just, you know, uh, a dream. And uh, sometimes I don't really realize what I'm doing. And maybe after a week, I watch myself on the phone. I'm like, oh, that's me, you know? Uh, so that, that's crazy. Thank you. All right. Well, watch this one back. We, we did it. This is Beyond the Track, and I'm really glad I was able to catch up with you, Lorenzo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.